Hello and welcome to all the men and women of the West. I'm Joe. Today's video is about the city of Palanthos, discussing the foundation of this city. Now, as every Dragonlance fan knows, Palanthos is probably the city in Dragonlance. It's called the Bright City because it's the greatest metropolis in Kryn. It is a magnificent city. It's where a part of the story of Test of the Twins takes place. It's in defense of the city of Palanthos that Sturm dies, and Raceland spends a bit of time there during the following book in Dragons of the Spring Dawning and Dragons of the Hourglass Mage book. He spends time there. We There's plenty to discuss, and well, first off, we'll start with where the city is located. Now, the ancient city, which is also called Palanthos the Beautiful. It's in the northwest corner of the mainland of the continent of Ancelon. So we know it's got a population of 32,000 by the time of the Age of Despair. Likely it was much, much higher in earlier eras, as it's noted during Dragons of Spring Dawning that a great deal of the city is depopulated. So likely what happened was that it is rather like Rome after the Gothic Wars of the 6th century. What happened with Rome, for those who are unfamiliar with its history, is that before the Gothic Wars of Justinian, a Byzantine emperor, or if you want to be more correct, the Greek Roman Empire, the Greeks came in, invaded Italy, and they tend to fight over Rome against a people called the Ostrogoths. Rome really suffered a lot of depredations. A lot of buildings were damaged, but the most damaged part was the population. To put it in perspective, Rome had a population of at least a million people by the time of Augustus. Over the centuries it had depopulated, but it was at least at a few hundred thousand by the time of the fall of the Western Empire. It was still going pretty good till the Gothic Wars when it was reduced to a few tens of thousands, possibly. So that puts it in perspective. There was a lot of plague, there was a lot of famine, there was a lot of war that served to depopulate a great deal of the city, which sadly a great deal of the monuments and buildings were damaged. Palanthos seems to have a fairly, ironically, Greek side to it. The people really strike me as being fairly Grecian in some of their physical descriptions, in their mindset, and in the way they kind of treat others. They also remind me of the city of Rome's population. You have Wace and Hickman who designed a very well thought out city-state culture, and you have a very, very interesting, both in how they run their city, the culture, and how they think of the rest of Kryn. They are clearly very different from the Germanic-styled Salamnic Knights. But how did the city come to be? Well, let's answer that question. Many millennia ago, who knows how many, <laughs> a small group of settlers got really tired of the constant threat of war. They're rather like the founding Romans of the Romulus and Remus myth, who got tired of just wandering around were generally exiles from other cities and then decide to settle the hills of Rome. So it's probably like that. But they were mostly looking for peaceful land to settle and raise their cattle and whatnot. The settlers signed on to a ship named Bright Horizon, and it was captained by a person by the name of Agril Stargazer. Agril had heard of a place known as the Dragon Isles, which was said to be paradise and very peaceful, but they never made it that far. They were hit by a storm, one that lasted for a few days, and it cost the lives of nearly half the ship's crew. Then it went away, and once they were calm, everyone looked around and kind of noticed there's a whole lot of nothing, and they're surrounded by mountains. And a mile away from the waterline stood a single tower, surrounded by a grove of trees. So they said, if we're looking for a quiet nowhere's town, this is it. This is it. Otherwise, we have to try to make it all the way to Middle Earth or to find the Shire, and well, we're not willing to go that far. So here we go. They decide, okay, they're going to tear down their boat, start using it to make firewood and a town, which, given the number of timber that was probably used to build this massive ship, they were probably looking at quite a few houses. Not a few hundred, but probably just a few dozen at most. They also discovered a bay called the Bay of... Brancawa was one that pirates rather liked. Pirates that were led by an infamous pirate called Firebrand, who was something of a little bit of a hothead. He liked to use it as a hideout 
when the Urgothian navy was near, made a deal with the settlers of the colony. She'd bring lumber and provisions, and they would build a proper town. At first, they called the town the Bright Horizon after their ship. Trouble is, Bright Horizon's reputation as a haven for pirates, smugglers, and other folk who were trying to get away from the law attracted the attention of a lot of people. One of these people was a rather vicious, not very nice guy called Vinus Salamnus. Salamnus, while the founder of Salamnia, was never a very good man. Well, he's basically Vlad the Impaler, except fantasy edition. Yet I won't get into Vinus today. That's another video for another day. The most important thing that Vinus did in regards to Palanthos, though, was that he refounded the town into a mighty city that he named after Paladin, Palanthos. Part of the reason they were able to regain their independence was twofold. One, they're incredibly hard to reach, and they live in an area that's easily defended from land invaders, and they do have high walls. Second, or I should say third main reason, is that they are an incredibly talented naval city-state. Their affinity for boat building is rather akin to Carthage of ancient history, and even Rome. They can also be compared to Athens. They would also establish a city senate, rather like Rome, and I'm not trying to beat that point too much. I just really love what the authors did, looking to Athens and Rome, the two greatest ancient cities of the West. I think that this sort of inspiration ought to be commended, and more authors should learn lessons from the writing here and the world building. That said, the Senate agreed to keep a certain amount of peace with the Salamnic Knights so that they'd have a Lord Knight who's their representative in the city. In turn, the Lord of Palanthos would be elected by the Senate and would be a member of the Palanthos community, and the Senate would rule the city. That's it for now. Hope you enjoyed this video. The lesson I think we can take from Palanthos is that it's from humble beginnings that great things rise. You may not think something's very important that you're doing right now, but someday it will be. If you enjoyed this video, the next video will be a Gods of Kryn video. But that's not all, for we at the corner have a great announcement to make in regards to tomorrow. We've got a bit of a special event happening on the 22nd. I've been invited, along with Dragonlance Nexus, over to Dragonlance Saga to partake in a Crintuber special event live stream, wherein we're going to do a lot of Q&A and do some Dragonlance hangout, and generally discuss Dragonlance, our thoughts, our love for it. So you'll have to, of course, subscribe to that channel to stay tuned for it, or just pay attention for our live stream on 22nd, and it'll be at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, or 2 p.m. Mountain Time. If you enjoyed this video, feel free to smash that like and that subscribe button, like your reorcs trying to forge the world into shape.